Well, folks, first of all, I just want to apologize for last th for last Thursday. Unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, I was unable to conduct a lecture online. So hopefully things are going to be back to quote unquote normal and we can resume our journey. So again, I thank you for your courtesy and your patience. And hopefully we'll have no more glitches on my end for the rest of the semester. So folks, I'm going to get started. And I am recording this session because I did receive a, an email from Angus earlier this afternoon that he's out in Wisconsin of dealing with a, a meet for the college. So he's not going to be able to join us this evening. So I'm going to begin. And folks, this chapter is going to be a rather interesting chapter. It's going to be a nice change of pace from what we've been de dealing with over the last several weeks. And for once again on that, I appreciate your patience with that because I know it's not one of the easiest things to deal with when you're going after analysis after analysis of transactions and dealing with journal entries. But I think you'll find tonight's material to be rather refreshing as well as interesting. So I'm going to get started. Folks, the first thing that I want to get into tonight is I want to get into our communication process and the issues and the entities that are involved in this process. And the first thing that I want to get into tonight is I want to focus on this fraud triangle. Now, this is typical in many accounting textbooks. You will see this in textbooks when they deal with the topic of internal control. What I want to focus on regarding this fraud triangle is not in terms of the safeguarding or protection of assets, but rather than dealing with the communication of what we're doing. We are communicating the resources that companies have and how those resources were acquired. And there are a number of side effects that pertain to that statement. One of the side effects is the ability to deliver products or provide services. And another side effect is the ability of companies to receive and spend money. Well, those elements tie into this broad triangle because there are a number of opportunities that exist within companies to lie, lie in terms of the quality of their accounts receivable, their inventories, their fixed assets, all their elements of the financial statements like liabilities, revenues, and expenses. And of course, there's incentive to do so. And a lot of the incentives are tied into compensation, especially compensation that is based on the issuance of stock. Many executives will receive as part of their compensation stock options, which gives the executives the ability to purchase stock at discounted prices. And if executives being compensated in the form of stock have the ability or the opportunity to manipulate the records that are used to communicate to our audience, well, executives may well have the opportunity to do so. And the rationalization that comes into play with this communication, the typical line is, well, everybody else is doing it. But another rationalization is that they're playing within the rules. And a couple of interesting cases when it comes to the playing of the rules, um, we talked about WorldCom and reading a book over the summer, Extraordinary Circumstances by Cynthia Cooper, who was the head of the internal audit function of WorldCom, who ultimately uncovered the fraud that was going on. The chief financial officer of the company used the matching principle to justify the fraud that was going on, that had gone on within the company. And then Enron had come up with a whole bunch of things that justified their actions. So when it comes to our role as communicators, this fraud triangle, triangle is applicable. And when you look at this slide, you see about corporate governance. And folks, the thing that I just want you to keep in mind is not every company has corporate governance problems, but when it comes to the ethical problems that lead to the improper communication of financial information, corporate governance is tied in it. And it really came into play with Enron, Lehman Brothers, and, and Tyco, just a, something to keep in mind. And what you see here in this illustration of Sarbanes-Oxley or Sarbox or Sox, 
this came about in response to the scandals that took place at companies like Enron, Tyco, WorldCom, Adelphia Cable, et cetera. So when we deal in our role as communicators, we have to remember what I consider the most important qualification for an accountant is integrity. We have to be trustworthy and we have to be trustworthy in a way that may well challenge the culture that has been established inside companies by corporate governance. Now, when it comes to the regulators, folks, what I like about this slide is it really gets into who is really in charge of the regulation of our work, and that's the Securities and Exchange Commission or the SEC. Now, as you can see in this illustration about protecting investors and maintaining the integrity of the securities markets, the SEC's role in regard to our work is to make sure that the information that is contained within the financial statements, as well as the notes to the financials, are telling the correct story. A story that investors, current and prospective, can rely upon to make the appropriate decisions. But the one thing that the SEC has done is it has delegated its responsibility in establishing the standards, or what I like to call our dictionary, to help us communicate the activities or transactions that exist with inside companies. And the Securities and Exchange Commission has delegated that responsibility to the Financial Accounting Standards Board or the FASB. The FASB, as you can see, sets generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. That very simply, folks, represents the rules that we follow in order to record and communicate transactions. The last entity that you see on this slide, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, that was in response to the scandals that took place 20 years ago in which Sarbanes-Oxley created this board to make sure that public accounting firms or auditing firms were doing what they should be doing. And that's making sure that companies that were presenting their financial information we're doing so in a way that was not misleading or outright criminal. Now, folks, what I want to emphasize in this slide is this first statement. Managers are primarily responsible for the information in the financial statements and disclosures. When we look at managers, regarding the companies that we've been dealing with and what you'll be dealing with with this semester's project are the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer. And the personal certification is tied to Sarbanes-Oxley. As you can see that we're dealing with each report filed with the SEC, and I'm going to get into the reports a little bit later, that they don't contain, contain untrue statements or omitted facts. There's completeness and validity regarding what's being presented. The second about weaknesses in internal controls over financial reporting, that is so that the process of identifying, reporting, and communication, and communicating transactions cannot be circumvented in ways that it presents misleading information. For example, when we look at a company like Target, if it's presenting a balance in its balance sheet as inventories, one can physically go to stores and warehouses to confirm the amounts listed on the financial statements. And it puts the onus on the auditors, people inside and outside the company and the audit committee, which I'll get into a little bit later, about weaknesses in internal controls or any type of fraud that could be exact be going on in financial reporting. And folks, the thing about financial reporting, it really puts the emphasis on the communication step in our process. The importance of management or managers is to make sure that what is being put out by the accounting function, as you see the accounting staff, is in fact being validated by management so that when something is appearing on a balance sheet, management agrees with it and it applies as well to the other financial statements. Now here, 
the board of directors. Now, folks, the thing that I find very interesting that continues to bring a smile to my face is this statement about assuring that the long-term interest of the shareholders are being served. A significant reason for the breakdowns that, that lead to fraud in the communication step of our work has to do with members of the board not serving the interest of the shareholders. And without question, one of the biggest issues that exist with board members is they are typically appointed by the, the chief executive officer of a company and the chief executive officer is looking for kind of sort of a, a quid pro quo in a number of cases. Whereas the, the, the member of the board will be an attorney at a law firm, may be a principal at an investment banking firm. And basically people like that, whether they be attorneys, investment bankers, consultants, they're gonna be looking for an environment where they'll sit on the board and in exchange, the company in which they're sitting, in which they're sitting on, is going to provide them business. So, if there's a company that has a significant legal matter, or if there's an attorney from a law firm sitting on the board, well, that attorney more likely than not is going to receive the business that pertains to this um, this litigation. So, when it comes to the board of directors, folks, the thing to keep in mind as you take the material that we're discussing in this course from the classroom to the job, the thing that you wanna make sure is that members of the board, if they are involved with other companies in terms of their employment, that there isn't a situation where the company in which these members are representing as, as members of the board are not receiving business from this company as kind of sort of a thank you for turning a blind eye to thing. And that I can tell you from the number of books that I read over the summer, that's been a significant issue as to where these breakdowns come into play and that the board members are getting compensated by the companies for work that these companies are providing. So the board members are more likely than not to look the other way when it comes to issues that exist related to the communication of financial information. Now, the audit committee of the board of directors, as you can see, they have really two prime responsibilities. One of them is this committee will appoint the outside accounting firm to do the audit of the company's books. This audit committee wants to make sure that they are picking a reputable firm so that this firm, when they see something that doesn't look right, it's gonna be brought to the attention of those responsible for the financial statements immediately. And also when it comes to the audit committee members, as you can see, besides the fact that they are not members of management, in other words, they're the members of the audit committee, they're not gonna be the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, the chief marketing officer, et cetera. But the key is that these people have financial knowledge. And I talked about this earlier in the semester, about O.J. Simpson when he was a member of the audit committee of, of Infinity Broadcasting. O.J. Simpson was a person with limited to no financial knowledge, so he really didn't bring anything to the table when it came to being a reliable member of the audit committee. So the audit committee is making sure that the quality of the financial statement exists in a manner so that no falsehoods are being communicated. The independent auditors, these are people who are employed outside the company and their prime responsibility is to make sure that the financial statements fairly present the situation that exists inside a company. Now folks, to keep in mind when it comes to the term independent, that has been an on going issue for decades. And I say decades because I go back to the fall 1984 semester. I know for some of you probably saying, well, I wasn't even born in 1984. If you are thinking that, thank you for adding more 
white hair to my head and my beard. Well, in the fall 1984 semester, I had taken an auditing course. It was one of the required courses to get an accounting degree at Temple University. Well, one of the things that was talked about in the auditing um, course was the distinctions between independence in fact and independence in appearance. And the auditing professor had mentioned that it's better for the auditing firm to be independent in appearance because the fact that they're projecting trustworthiness or independence in its work, it gives investors and creditors a better sense or a more, a more comfortable feeling that any problem that's going to exist is going to be uncovered. But the independent folks, I want you to keep in mind, this was a significant issue at Enron. The independent auditors that went through the books of this company was Arthur Anderson. And Arthur Anderson had a very hard time remaining independent because it was generating revenues at the rate of $1 million a week from Enron. So when you have one client paying you over $50 million in fee revenue a year, it's awful difficult for an auditor to remain independent. This is something I can tell you has been an ongoing issue and in all likelihood will continue to be an ongoing issue. And the primary role of an independent auditor, as you can see in this slide, is this unqualified audit opinion. Now, when you see the word unqualified, you think of unqualified as someone who's not able to perform a task. Well, for our work, the unqualified basically means that there are no issues that are affecting the presentation of the company's financial health as it relates to the financial statements. So an unqualified opinion basically means is that the financial statements fairly present the situation that exists with, inside a company. And I can tell you, when it comes to my work, when I had my accounting firm, lenders clearly relied on the audit opinions to make sure that besides the work that I was doing, the auditors were going through the records to make sure they were giving a clean bill of health. And today, we have what's called the big four. As uh, at, at Temple University, it was the big eight. It ultimately became the big six. It's now the big four. And these are the four accounting firms that are global. They are involved in, besides audit, they're involved in consulting and tax work. But there are many other accounting firms that exist, national, regional, local. And a lot of accounting firms that are, that are labeled local, you may think of them as just doing tax returns. Yes, many accounting firms will specialize in the preparation of taxes, but the accounting firms, when we look at them, their primary focus is in the auditing, the review of the financial statements to make sure that they fairly present the, the situation that exists that's being communicated through the financial statements. And as you can see, some public companies or most private companies, they are audited by, by smaller firms because I will tell you, these four firms, their services don't come cheaply. Now, when it comes to the work that you're gonna be doing as it relates to the project, you're gonna be doing the work of a financial analyst. And information is available in a, in a variety of sources. Now, this service, Edgar, this is a service that the, the Securities and Exchange Commission uses as it relates to the information that is being submitted to them from publicly traded companies. I personally have not relied upon Edgar to get the information that I look for. Many years ago, I did use CompuStat or Thomson Reuters. Um, the information on the web, Bloomberg, I never used. MarketWatch, very little.
Google, believe it or not, I don't use it that much, but the information on the web, what I have found the easiest for me to use is Yahoo. But I'm kind of old school when it comes like this, and maybe because it's my, my work, I tend to go to the company's websites and I go into the investor relations section to get the information that I need. Once in a while, I will go through Yahoo Finance, but mainly to get a sense of the competitors of the companies that I'm reviewing. But I tend to go through the information that I can find on a company's website. I'll go through whether it be the annual report or the annual report submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission, the 10K, just to make sure that I go through and I look for things that I can go through the financial statements and get what I need. But basically what the financial analysts are looking for is to get a sense as to where this company is going. Is it going forward or is it going backward? And when I talk about going forward or backward, is it going, is it going in a way that can help? Um, folks, I'm just going to respond to a question that Brian asked, and he asked, can we use E-Trade to analyze the companies? Um, my short answer, uh, Brian, is you, you could, again, maybe because of the fact that I've been working with financial statements for so many long, for so many years, I really haven't used E-Trade to review the financial statements. Um, so my, my, my shortest of the short answers is I don't know. Personally, if I was going to use something outside of the company's financial statements, I would rely on Yahoo Finance. I have found it to be um, the easiest to use and also useful in getting the information um, that I need. Uh, Brian, did I answer your question on that? Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Professor. If oh, I have any other questions, I'll let you know. That sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, I'm kind of sort of old school when it comes to stuff like this. I still like to roll up my sleeves, even though I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt. I will tend to roll up the sleeves and really get into the company's financials that appear on their websites to do the digging that I need. And I'm, we're going to get into this a little bit later as we continue our process. And here is an example of Apple. Now, folks, this chapter... Apple is going to be our company. We're going to get away from, from food and we're going to get into consumer goods as it relates to technology. And as you can see on this page, you see that there are links where we can get information about the competitors that Apple has. Uh, we can get the financial statements. You'll see on the right, there'll be news articles pertaining to Apple or any company that you're, that's being reported, the upcoming events that will take place, as you can see, earnings releases, um, the annual shareholders meeting, and you will see certain financial ratios that exist for Apple and, and their competitors. And of course, th those of you who are interested in investing, particularly those of you who are chartists, you will see a chart that will give you an idea of the trend of the company stock price. What I typically would focus on in a site like this, I might look at the financial ratios, but I'm more interested in the competitors and the financial statements because I want to get a sense, first of all, from the financial statements, whether there's any type of trends that are going on and what the competitors, and I did this work a couple of years ago when I was doing work for the, for the consumer products company. I was really spending a lot of time getting competitor information because I wanted to see whether there was any similarities that were existing in some financial numbers. Because one of the things that you're going to find when you're comparing companies within an industry, there are going to be some similarities in ratios that we talked about this semester, like the current ratio, the profit margin ratio, the asset turnover ratio. So there is some relevance when it comes to looking at the, at the competitors. But my main focus has always been on the financial statements, just to get a little bit of a sense of getting kind of sort of a quick and dirty, because sometimes I prefer looking at this rather than going through the details of the financial statements that appear on the company's websites. Now, when it comes to analytics, folks, what I definitely want to impress upon you here, 
when it comes to anal the, the data analytics related to the auditors is I'm going to make a connection to statistics. And one of the things that is taught in statistics is the concept of sampling. And what sampling basically means is that an entire population is not going to be looked at. So when it comes to auditors looking at a company's financial records, the limits in technology prevented companies from looking at every transaction just because the volume was too great. Well, with the advances of technology and with the field of data analytics, whether you call it data analytics, data science, analytics, technology is allowing people in these fields to look at every transaction. And with the help of technology, it can identify potential fraud. That's why one of the things that I've been emphasizing to my students, I, I don't know whether it's going to happen in my lifetime, but it's definitely going to happen in my students' lifetime where sampling is going to disappear. And you see this point here about smaller statistic, statistical samples. I really expect sampling to go away because of the advances in technology. And what that's going to mean is that auditors are going to have a much better way of really communicating whether or not financial statements are, in fact, telling the truth. So once again, when it comes to information services, and we're talking about um, the online services like Bloomberg, Google, and Yahoo, it definitely serves as a place where financial analysts can take a look at information. If you are looking for a job, you can use it to get information about a company. But for me, I really think the websites are the best place to look. That's what I tend to go to. I want to take a look at the websites to, to read about the company's history, get a little sense of what the company has been doing. Also, I really spend a good deal of time on the investor relations section to get to the financial statements, whether they be in an annual report or a 10K, to really get a sense for what is going on and do a whole bunch of trending to really see what kind of story is being told, okay? Folks, before I, oh, not done yet, pardon me. So in this particular section, I always want you to remember our audience. And I've talked about our audience being investors and creditors. And as you can see, institutional investors, pension funds, the largest that exists in this country is Cal CalPERS, the California Pension Fund, which basically serves the interest of the public employees in the state of California. Mutual investors, firms like Fidelity, they would be deemed an institutional investor. Endowment funds, colleges. Colleges get involved with taking tuition money and investing it into companies. So institutional investors, as you can see, represents an element of the audience that we serve. Well, private investors. I've dealt with angel investors. I've dealt with private equity firms. They serve as an audience because they're representing an interest in that they're going to provide capital to businesses in the forms of cash, inventories, fixed assets, intellectual property. So we want to make sure that their needs are being suited. And then, of course, creditors. Creditors can be suppliers, can be service providers, can be also lenders. Because what we want to do with creditors is, first of all, when it comes to lenders, we want to make sure that they have confidence that the cost of the money being lent, interest is being paid, and that they're ultimately going to be repaid for what they are lending. And of course, with suppliers and service providers, we want to communicate information to them in ways that they can feel comfortable that they're going to ultimately get paid when they're extending credit to their customers, okay? Before we get into the next learning objective, does anyone have any questions or comments on what I've talked about so far? Okay, let's get to the second learning objective of this chapter. Now here, 
you see this SEC regulation FD or fair disclosure. Now, basically, what this means is that we're having a level playing field. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make a connection to a topic in microeconomics known as asymmetric information. And what asymmetric information means when you learn about it in microeconomics is that one party has more information about a situation than the other party. When you think about selling a car or even selling your home, you as the seller are going to have more information about the car or home that you're selling than the buyer. So as a result, you're going to be an advantage at determining an appropriate price for the car or home that you're selling. But when it comes to companies and it comes to the buying and selling of ownership, shares of stock, we want to make sure that there is, in fact, a level playing field. And the thing that the Securities and Exchange Commission really polices is insider information. The thing that the SEC is looking for is to make sure that management is not profiting by the knowledge that it has on situations that are existing within companies. Perhaps the losing of a key customer, maybe a supplier cutting off shipments, maybe, <coughs> excuse me, maybe the pending sale of a division. So when it comes to the SEC as part of disclosure, they want to make sure that this level playing field includes as a situation in which management is not using the information that it has at its disposal regarding a number of situations and use that information to profit by it. And when it comes to publicly traded companies, there will be quarterly and annual earnings announced through press releases can also be done through conference, through conference calls. But the Securities and Exchange Commission requires at minimum quarterly communication of financial information. And of course, the big one would be the annual reporting process. And when it comes to the stock market, now this month, folks, is a very interesting month because last month, September, was the close of the third quarter of the calendar year. And it also serves for many companies the close of the third quarter of the fiscal year. So this month, companies that rely on calendar reporting, January through December, are going to use this month to communicate with the outside world. And the communication is going to have an effect on how the stock market reacts. And notice the second bullet point. When it comes to the reaction to the market, it's not the amount of the earnings that the market is reacting to, but a difference. When it comes to expectations, the market or the financial analysts, they are provided guidance as to what earnings are going to be for the quarter's end. So the expected earnings, that is basically being provided beforehand. The concern is when the actual differs from the expectation. That's what's going to drive the movement in the stock. And I will tell you that when it comes to this particular bullet point, there's a great deal of work that can go on especially when the company is distressed. And I've talked this semester about Woolworth, and I want to share with you another Woolworth story. When it comes to a company that is experiencing cash flow problems, mainly the inability to generate cash inflows or cash receipts, companies like Woolworth will look at a number of ways to remedy that situation. 
Well, one of the things that Woolworth ultimately did was it eliminated a dividend. And one of the things that keep in mind, folks, when we talk about our audience, most notably institutional investors, institutional investors will look at companies that pay dividends because it represents a consistent or steady stream of income. Institutional investors will look at companies solely based on dividends. They're not looking, and they being the institutional investors, are not looking at the stock to appreciate in value. The priority is the dividend. That's the income that the institutional investors, but most notably the pensioners, are going to receive. Well, Woolworth went through a great deal of effort to, for lack of a better word, massage the analyst to basically make sure that the analyst did not panic in a way that would have caused a free fall in the price of Woolworth stock. So I will tell you that when it comes to this second bullet point, companies that feel that any type of bad news is going to cause the stock to drop dramatically, the company will make any and every effort to make sure that confidence remains in the company, okay? So just something to keep in mind. Now, here you see an example of a press release. And as you can see, Apple is reporting its fourth quarter results. And you can see the two statistics that they're highlighting, revenue and earnings per share or EPS. And folks, this is one thing that I talked about in my recording this morning, because I did record um, a lecture from what I was going to do last week pertaining to chapter four. Earnings per share or EPS is a major driver. And folks, one thing, if you have the opportunity to do so, tune into the business networks, whether it's Bloomberg, CNBC or Fox, because I assure you this month, you're going to be hearing a lot of news from companies providing their earnings per share or EPS numbers, especially as it relates to movement. So as you can see with Apple, giving information about quarterly revenue, the change that took place, the earnings per share diluted. Folks, another thing that I talked about in my lecture, this earnings per share calculation is not the easiest thing to get into. Diluted is an intermediate accounting topic, so I'm not going to get into the details on that. And you can also see highlighting a key driver of revenue growth, the international sales. And you can see the comments being made by the company's chief financial officer, really giving highlights, but really showing management's involvement in what's going on inside the company to, again, project confidence to the outside world as to what's going on with the company. Okay, so there's something just to keep in mind here when it comes to a way that companies communicate to the outside world, most notably when it comes to quarterly results. And when it comes to disclosure, the annual reports and the Form 10K, <coughs> excuse me, are in fact different. The annual reports will typically be books, books that are produced. And I can tell you, one of the companies that I work for in private industry, ComputerShare, it's a company based in, up in, in Canton, Mass. Those of you who are familiar with Route 93 in Canton, you'll see the headquarters from the highway. Well, ComputerShare, one of the things that it, that it does is it produces the annual reports of companies. So the annual reports would serve as a vehicle to communicate to what's going on. And these reports are sent to the company's shareholders. And you can also find these reports online. The Form 10K, we are dealing exclusively with what privately, or pardon me, publicly held companies have to submit to the SEC on an annual basis. The 10K is the equivalent of an annual report, but this report, folks, is submitted specifically 
to the SEC because the SEC is interested in information like the financial statements that we've talked about so far this semester, the notes to the financial statements, the auditor's report, and also more qualitative information, the description of the business operations and a strategy. Selected financial data, we're gonna get into that a little bit later. Management discussion and analysis or MD&A. Really looking at kind of sort of a SWOT. If you've not heard of SWOT, it's an acronym spelled S-W-O-T. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then of course the financial statements and any supplemental data. And the supplemental data will really focus on the notes to the financial statements, okay? But the thing that I just want you to take from this slide, folks, is that an annual report, the audience would be the shareholders and those people like me who like going into company websites to go into the investor relations section to get information. I know, get a life, but hey, I gotta, I, I gotta do something to entertain myself. But the Form 10K, the audience for that is the Securities and Exchange Commission. Now here, when it comes to quarterly reports, for publicly traded companies, that is a requirement. And they, they being the publicly traded companies, have to submit what's called a 10Q. The 10Q is the designation that the SEC has made for publicly traded companies to submit quarterly information. And then you can see regarding the SEC, they will also require reports, basically current events or any type of material information. As you can see examples, changes in, in auditors, any type of mergers or acquisitions, that would be represented in a form 10K. Folks, this is strictly qualitative. There really isn't a, a deal, a great deal or any deal of financial information. The focus is any news that could affect, affect the financial statements. But here's the thing to keep in mind, the quarterly reports for privately held companies, they will be required, especially by lenders. I can tell you, in my work in private industry, companies that I work for that had lines of credit, loans with banks, I would typically have to put together quarterly information for the banks to receive in order to determine any changes in the loan agreement, an increase in the borrowing base or changes of the interest rates. But folks, what I definitely want to talk about here, and it's something for you to keep in mind, this word quarterly. When you work at a publicly traded company, you develop a quarterly mindset. And this really came to play for me working at Woolworth. One of the divisions I had worked at within the corporation, at that time, the Kitty Shoe Corporation, I was told by my boss's boss, no surprises at the quarter end. And the surprise, it wasn't good good news he was concerned about, it was bad news. And the reason for that, if bad news, especially bad news that was unexpected, was being presented, well, that could be construed by the market as things to, to come, and that would lead to a decline in the stock price. And what I eventually did as I progressed in the company to deal with making sure that no surprises, other words, bad news, was going to come at quarter end, as I actually had a process that I went through during the quarters. The first month of the quarter, I went through the financials, most notably the ledger, to make sure that any transaction that didn't belong in a certain account was moved to an appropriate account. And just to make sure that the integrity of the, of the accounts were there. And then the second quarter, it was just mainly a double check, just to make sure that there was nothing else funny going on. So by the time the third quarter came about, 
I basically knew that the integrity of the financials was at its highest standard, so there would be no issues when it came to the quality or the integrity of the financials as it related to quarterly reporting. And I mentioned this, folks, because when it comes to the, the saying about you can take the, 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 the person out of the quarterly, but you can't take the quarterly out of the person. Even when I left private industry and worked at my accounting firm, I still had a quarter end mindset because I knew the people that I was going to be working with or people representing my audience, they would have that quarterly mindset because I will tell you, the SEC has really put a quarterly mindset to people who are involved in financial statements, whether they're writing them or reading them. This is something that I would like you to take from the classroom to the job, because I assure you that when you are working with people who are been involved in the accounting profession, especially those who have worked in financial accounting, any experience that these people have had in publicly traded companies, this quarterly mindset exists. And I can tell you folks, it's awfully, awfully difficult to shake. But the good thing is, is it ensures the integrity of the financial reporting. Okay, so I can tell you that from my perspective. But one thing that I do at quarter end, those financial statements were, were looking pretty. There were really, there was nothing there that was going to raise a question to say, there, we got a problem. Okay? Before I get into the third learning objective of this chapter, does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay. Well, folks, the one thing to keep in mind, as you're doing your projects, you are going to be using comparative financial statements. And what I mean by comparative financial statements, you're going to be able to look at numbers over a two or three year period to get your arms wrapped around the story that the company is telling. And you will see, and I will mention in the second point that you notice, there is going to be different terminology or different formats that companies will use. You will see this when we get into Apple's financial statements. Now, when it comes to the additional disclosures, this is where the story really is. And people like Warren Buffett, will really go through the notes to the financial statements because people like Warren Buffett who were involved in investing, this in the, people like Buffett are really going to find the information that's really going to tell whether what appears on the financial statements make any sense from the perspective of financial health. Another gentleman, I don't know whether you've heard this gentleman's name, Michael Burry. Well, Michael Burry, folks, one book that I recommend that you get is The Big Short, written by Michael Lewis. I don't know whether any of you have seen the movie. I have not seen the movie, but I have read the book. Those of you who have read Michael Lewis's books, The Big Short is definitely one of the better ones that I've read. And Michael Burry is a prime character in this story. And a little bit of background about Michael Burry. Michael Burry was a med student who well, ultimately left the medical field and became an investor. Well, one of the things about Michael Burry is he suffers from Asperger's syndrome. And believe it or not, one of the benefits he's had of having Asperger's is having the patience to go through these voluminous notes that exist. He finds them quite enlightening. And he really used his Asperger's syndrome to go through the written reports that, that involved the, the mortgage-backed securities that were issued earlier in the century that ultimately led to the financial crisis of 2008. So 
something to keep in mind when it comes to the additional disclosures, without question, there is a lot of news that appears here. And another gentleman who I'm going to introduce you to later in the semester, Howard Chillett, is a person who firmly believes that the notes of the financial statements are where you can find inconsistencies or questionable items that ultimately lead to whether or not companies are in fact committing fraudulent acts as they relate to financial statements. And folks, any of you who had any interest in technology, specifically artificial intelligence, natural language processing is a great place to incorporate it in terms of these additional disclosures. And if anyone would like to talk more about this offline, please feel free to let me know. I'll be more than happy to engage in conversation. Now here, as you can see, our company for this week is Apple. And we see that we have its consolidated balance sheet. And once again, when a company presents a consolidated financial statement, it is taking all of the entities associated with the company and listing it in total. I talked a lot about Woolworth. When Woolworth was in operation, it would present consolidated financial statements. One set of financial statements for the FW Woolworth Company, Kitty Shoe Corporation, Woolworth Canada, et cetera, all presented together as one. And as you can see, this is a comparative balance sheet. We have two years worth of information. Fiscal year 2017, fiscal year 2016. And as you can see, we have a variety of items that come into play. And once again, the basics remain. We list the long-term, uh, pardon me, the current assets first, then the long-term assets. And as you can see in current assets, we always begin with cash because we are focusing on the most liquid assets. Assets that could be quickly converted to cash. Cash will be first. Then we'll have the short-term marketable securities, then receivables. Now, inventory is rather interesting, folks. Because Apple has manufacturing, some companies will list a breakdown of its, of its manufacturing inventories. Apple is summarizing it. This is something that you would, I would go to immediately to the notes because I'd want to see the breakdown of the, of the manufacturing inventories. The vendor non-trade receivables, this has to do with a specific relationship that Apple has with its vendors. It's a little bit above and beyond this particular course. And then other current assets could be, it would be mainly um, prepaid expenses and supplies. Then you'd have the long-term marketable securities. These are investments in bonds and stocks that management does not intend to sell within a year. Then of course, you'd have your property, plant and equipment or fixed assets, goodwill. This is generated when Apple acquires other companies. Uh, for example, Beats. We'll get into this later in the semester when we get into intangible assets. And speaking of intangible assets, I find very interesting that Apple uses the term acquired because GAAP requires us to capitalize or record on the balance sheet intangible assets that are purchased. Other non-current assets could be some long-term receivables, but it's something that I would want to look at in the notes to get a little bit more of a handle as to what these are, okay? And then after assets, again, our fundamentals. We get into our liabilities first, and again, we divide the liabilities into current and long-term. Once again, our one-year rule comes into play. If the liability is going to be settled in full within one year, we classify the liability as current, if not long-term. Then we total the liabilities, and then we get into shareholders, our stockholders' equity. We have the common stock, as well as additional paid in capital. Folks, notice the par value of Apple stock. Once again, that par value 
has this much, zero, nothing to do with the market price of the company stock, then the retained earnings, and then the accumulated other comprehensive income, I will get into that shortly. But folks, the thing that I would be doing when it comes to looking at the consolidated balance sheets or the comparative consolidated balance sheets, I would want to see the changes in total assets from year to year and the changes in total liabilities, the stockholders' equity. And folks, what I find very interesting about this is I want you to see the change in total liabilities between 2016 and 2017. It's gone up almost $50 billion. And why I find that interesting is Apple was a company that I studied for quite some time a number of years ago. And one of the craziest things that I found with Apple when it came to its growth last decade and the beginning of last decade and during the first decade of this century, Apple did it with no debt. And when I'm talking about debt, you see here the current portion of long-term debt and the long-term debt. It was amazing on how Apple did not use borrowed money to finance its growth. So I would really focus on the liabilities and I would draw connections to what's going on with the assets and see how the liabilities are providing the resources that Apple's using. So that's just a, a, a few comments um, that I have. Uh, before I continue um, with, with the presentation, does anyone have any questions about this balance sheet? Okay. Now, when it comes to the income statement, again, the classification or this classified income statement really focuses on process. The process, when we're dealing with manufacturing and merchandising companies, companies, oh, pardon me, that sell products, we want to communicate a statistic called gross profit. Gross profit, also known as gross margin, is nothing more than the difference between a company's sales and its cost of goods sold. Then the next statistic is operating income or income from operations. We would be taking the gross profit and subtracting operating expenses, expenses like advertising, sal um, salaries, supplies, utilities. And then we get into the non-operating items that would be other revenues and gains, other expenses and losses, most notably interest expense and revenues and any types of gains or losses on disposals of fixed assets. That would give us another statistic called income before income taxes. Then we get the income tax expense to give us the big statistic, net income. So when we're looking at this label, classified income statement, the focus is on the steps that generate key statistics for our audience to understand the ability of companies to deliver products or provide their services. And as you can see within Apple, now folks, before I get into this, you're gonna see that the income statement provides three years worth of data. The balance sheet provides two. Every company that I've seen does the same thing. Three years of income statement data, two years of balance sheet data. Other than an SEC requirement, I have no idea why the income statement contains three instead of two, or why the balance sheet contains two, but not three. So in case you're wondering why the income statement shows three years instead of two, my guess, it is an SEC requirement. But you see within the classification, we have our first key statistic, gross profit. Then we have operating income, the income before income taxes. Then we have net income. And then we communicate based on a per share basis, 
and then the, the basis for calculating the earnings per share. Folks, I talked about EPS in my lecture of material from chapter four, and we're going to continue this a little bit later, okay? So I'll get into that in time, but I did talk about it in my chapter four lecture. Now, folks, the thing that I want to highlight here is research and development. Companies like Apple, and they're going to apply to other companies that you may choose for your project. Amazon, Facebook, Alphabet, even traditional manufacturing companies like 3M. 3M, if you're not familiar with this company, Post-it Notes and Scotch Tape. They're going to include a line in its operating expenses called research and development. This is a material item for our audience because it provides our audience, specifically investors, with insights into the effectiveness of a company's effort to innovate, okay? Research and development is a key item for in, to look at innovation, okay? And I can tell you from my study with Apple, for many years, Apple has been classified as the most innovative company in the world. And when I would do my research into companies, innovative companies, and looking at their R&D as a percentage of sales, I could come up with a standard of 9%. In other words, for every dollar that a company was, was generating in sales, nine cents was being spent on R&D. Well, what I found interesting with Apple, at its peak, it was spending about one cent in R&D for its sales. When you see a situation like that, when you think of a company that is labeled or described as innovative, and you look at R&D or research and development as, as having a very small percentage of sales, and I would say small, less than 5%, that raises questions, and this is very interesting. What else is, it, 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 it is there in this part of this process? And for me, I just think it just shows the strength of the Apple brand, and in particular, the loyalty that Apple's customers have to the products that the company sells. So just a little bit of comment on that. But well, folks, as you can see, you notice a significant change from the end of 2015 to 2016 and 17, I would definitely do some exploration, especially the decline in sales between 2015 and 2016. I would like to see what's going on there. And that would bring me to the notes to the financial statements to do some further investigation in the sales. But as you can see, there's definitely some things that happened in 2016 that were noticeably different in 2015, I would look at that as a gauge to see, well, what is going on as you can see or what happened. And then you can see 2017 kind of sort of leveled off. So I would just want to look a little bit more to see if whether there's anything that I can get my arms wrapped around to really get a better sense of the story that Apple is telling through its income statements, okay? Before I continue, does anyone have any questions about this financial statement? Okay. Now, the earnings per share. Now, you see for the net income, an asterisk. If preferred dividends. Now, I'm going to get into later in the semester when we get into stockholders' equity, a form of stock called preferred stock. Very, just keep in mind, folks, at this point, if a company has issued preferred stock and if there are any preferred dividends, we just back that out or subtract it from the net income because our focus is on the common stockholders, okay? The common stockholders because common stockholders bear 
the greatest amount of risk when it comes to their investment in a company. So we want to make sure that the earnings per share or the EPS really represents information that's useful to the common stockholder. And once again, the earnings per share represents a relationship to the, in, to the income earned based on one share of common stock that's issued. So I'll just give you an example. And I talked about this in my lecture of, of chapter four with Chipotle. Let's suppose a company has an earnings per share of $10. Well, what that $10 simply means is that if a stockholder has one share of common stock, the company is earning income at a rate of $10. That's simply what the earnings per share calculation means. But once again, this is a statistic that the outside world, especially business media like Bloomberg, CNBC, and Fox, really like to get their hands on so they can communicate to investors, whether they be currently involved in a company or prospective investors to put their money into a company. Now, we get into this concept of comprehensive income. And folks, comprehensive income is a concept that really came about from economists. An economist for a long time, have been saying that the net income statistic is insufficient. Additional information is provided, is necessary, in order to communicate the ability of a company to earn income. So what has happened is a measurement called comprehensive income has been developed. And as a result, we have this statement of comprehensive income. And all we're doing is we're taking the net income number and we're including other elements. Foreign currency. Let's suppose that Apple is holds stock in a company based in England. Well, the investment is going to be valued in pounds, the currency of England. Well, besides the change in the value of the stock, the currency value is going to change because currency, like any other commodity, can change in its value. So when the British pound or the euro, the Canadian dollar, the Japanese yen changes in value. We have this change in foreign, foreign currency tr translation. That simply means the relationship between the US dollar and whatever foreign currency, whether it be the Canadian dollar, the pound, the yen, when that relationship changes, it causes a change in foreign currency that represents an element in of comprehensive income. Now, what I want to focus on here in the last two items is this word unrealized, okay? Let's take a very simple example. Let's suppose that today I buy stock at a company, and I bought the stock at a price of $10 per share. At the end of this year, December 31st, 2021, I still have ownership in the stock, but the price of the stock has gone up from 10 to $15. That means I have a, an unrealized gain. The gain is the change in the value of the stock 
from $10, the price I w- at which I bought it, and $15, the price that the stock is valued at at the end of the year. It's unrealized because I have not sold the stock. Let's take this example. Today, I buy stock in a company in which I bought the stock once again at a price of $10 a share. Well, at the end of this year, December 31st, 2021, the price of the stock is $5 a share. That decline of 10 to 5 results in a loss. But I haven't sold the stock. Therefore, I have an unrealized loss. Unrealized means the stock has not been sold, but there's been a change in value that results in a gain or loss. And these unrealized gains and losses are elements that appear in a statement of comprehensive income because What it represents, folks, is a way for us to communicate what management's doing as it relates to activities outside the United States and more specific activities that lead to investments in financial capital in bonds and stock versus investments in intangible capital like patents, copyrights, and trademarks or physical capital like inventories, factories, warehouses, stores, computers, delivery vans, okay? Before I continue, does anyone have any questions on what I discussed regarding this statement? If anyone would like to talk more about comprehensive income, please feel free to communicate with me offline. I'll be more than happy to continue the conversation. Now here, we get the gross profit percentage. And the gross profit percentage, again, gross profit is the difference between sales and cost of goods sold. And we can use this relationship, this ratio to establish a relationship. Now, when it comes to gross profit percentages, it's going to depend on the industry. For example, paper products, paper manufacturers, companies that manufacture paper towels and toilet paper, the gross profit percentages are going to be very small. A paper manufacturer that generates a gross profit percentage of 5%, it's actually pretty good. If it's close to 10%, it's doing gangbusters. That's basically basically because of the nature of the product being sold. Now, medical companies. Medical companies can command a much higher gross profit percentage. And I just mentioned this because going back years ago when I was doing work at a paper manufacturer, seeing the gross profit percentages being so small. And then I was working with Martin on a medical startup, and he was talking about the gross profit percentage being 70%. And what that means, folks, is that for every dollar that a company was generating in sales, the gross profit, the difference between sales and cost of goods sold was 70 cents. And I was blown away by that number. And I just kept asking, what, is that for real? Does that make any sense? And he said, yes, because when it comes to medical companies, especially the biotech, the startups, they generate enormous value with what they're producing. So just Keep in mind, folks, that these gross profit percentages, you have to be aware of the type of product that is being sold because some products are going to generate lower margins than others. Now we get to the statement of stockholders' equity. And here, as you can see, it is divided into contributed capital, as you can see, the common stock and the additional paid in capital, and earned capital, which is retained earnings. And then we have the accumulated other comprehensive income or loss. We begin with the beginning of the fiscal period. And then we have all of the elements that affect stockholders' equity. Net income, 
other comprehensive income or loss, any dividends that were declared, stocks that, stock that was issued, stock that was repurchased. And you can see we provide a breakdown based on contributed and earned capital, and then we provide a total. So at September 30th, 2017, the total shareholders equity or stockholders equity for Apple was a little bit more than $134 billion. And as you can see, we have the number of shares that, have, that are outstanding, over 5 billion shares issued. And then you see the dollar amount associated with those shares. And then, of course, the retained earnings, the earned capital, and any elements that represent other comprehensive income. Again, foreign currency translation and any unrealized gains or losses involved with securities. Now, the statement of cash flows, GAP organizes our communication as to how companies receive and spend money. We have operating activities, then we have investing activities, then we have financing activities. The operating activities, the focus is gonna be on the income statement and any changes in current assets and current liabilities. The investing activities, the focus is on long-term assets, long-term investments, fixed assets, intangible assets. Financing activities, long-term liabilities, and stockholders' equity. And what our focus is in our communication when it comes to the statement of cash flows, I'm gonna go from financing to operating. Raising money to acquire long-term resources that conduct relationships. That's another way of phrasing what the statement of cash flow does. And then folks, to keep in mind, because of accrual basis accounting, net income and cash provided by operating activities will not be the same. Please keep that in mind. That is because of accrual basis accounting. We are recognizing or recording revenues when earned and expenses when incurred, not when cash has been received or when cash has been paid. And as you can see, the main focus of communicating cash flows from operating activities, the primary method is the indirect method. And the indirect method, nothing more represents a bridge to connect an accrual basis accounting statistic, net income, and convert it to a cash basis accounting statistic, cash provided by operating activities. You will see the adjustments shortly, okay? So let's get to Apple's statement of cash flow. As you can see, it provides three years worth of data. And we begin our communication with the beginning balance. We then provide the operating activities, then the investing activities, then the financing activities, then we show any increases and decreases in cash based on the three individual activities. Then we provide what the cash balance is at the end of the year. Folks, what I'm gonna focus on regarding this statement, first of all, the operating activities. Again, we focus on an accrual basis accounting statistic, net income. But remember what we are doing. We are describing cash flow. Accrual basis accounting does not describe cash flow. Therefore, we have to incorporate a variety of adjustments in order to go from a, an accrual basis accounting statistic, net income, to a cash basis accounting statistic cash provided by operating activities. And the two biggest or the items are gonna be depreciation and amortization, okay? 
those elements will typically appear as adjustments to net income. Other non-cash items will typically be gains or losses when fixed assets have been sold. And that has to do with the investing activities. The changes in operating assets and liabilities, we are dealing with changes in current assets like accounts receivable and inventory, liabilities like accounts payable and accrued expenses. But what we are doing here is we are converting accrual basis accounting to cash basis accounting, okay? So just keep that in mind when it comes to the operating activities. But what I find most interesting in Apple, notice the investing activities. Folks, what you see in the purchase and sale of marketable securities, that's actually billions of dollars. So when you look at September 30th, 2017, the purchase of marketable securities, Apple during fiscal year 2017 bought over $159 billion worth of marketable securities, bonds, and stock. Folks, that comes from the cash flow that is being generated from the sale of iPads, iPods, iPhones, MacBooks. Those sales that's generating cash receipts, Apple has so much cash coming in. And believe me, folks, it used to be a lot higher. Apple has to do something with that money because when it puts that money in the bank, it's not earning interest. So what Apple does is it takes its excess cash and it puts it toward the purchase and sale of marketable securities. So the excess cash coming in from the sale of its products can earn income. And I, can, and I find that interesting because this has been reported in the past. The cash flow from Apple that is leading to the purchase and sales of marketable securities is greater than the gross domestic product of many countries. Kind of scary when you think about Apple generates more income than a number of countries that exist in this world. I thought you'd find this a little bit interesting. I certainly found it interesting. So folks, once again, this statement of cash flows, it tells the story on how companies receive and spend money. The focus is on where the cash is coming in and where the cash is going out, okay? Before I continue, does anyone have any questions about this financial statement? Once again, if anyone has any questions about this statement, please feel free to contact me offline. I'll be more than happy to continue the conversation. Now, when it comes to the financial statements, we in include notes to the financial statements or footnotes. The key elements, the rules that the company is following. In other words, which methods of gap are being used within the individual elements of the financial statements, additional details, and additional financial information. Because this is one thing I talked about, folks, earlier this semester. The financial statements can only tell so much. We need to be more expansive in our communication, and we do that within the third item. We add a lot more to what's going on so our audience can get a better handle on the financial situation that exists within a company. Now here, you're seeing within the accounting policies of Apple, it's accounting for property, plant, and equipment, or as I was brought up on, fixed assets. And what you see here is typically standard. 
you see that we're telling our audience that the fixed assets are stated at cost. The depreciation, the allocation of costs from the balance sheet to the income statement is done by the straight line method. And I'm gonna get into that when we get into fixed assets. And it's being done over an estimated useful life. For buildings, the lesser of 30 years or the remaining life of the underlying building, two and five years for machinery and equipment, and also, when it comes to leases, leasehold improvements, this would apply to the stores that Apple operates, the lease term, which is 10 years. So here, what you're seeing is when a company is taking a look at the balance sheet, the fixed assets and the accumulated depreciation, this note is providing more information that will help the, our audience acquire better information or better insights into fixed assets and accumulated depreciation. And here, within the fixed assets, we're providing a breakdown. The land and buildings, the machinery and equipment, inter internal use software, again, software. This is software, folks, not included within the MacBooks, the iPads, the iPhones. It is what the company is using internally it's accounting software and the like. Leasehold improvements, folks, this is when companies like Apple or specifically retailers, when they have stores, they don't own the space, they lease the space. When they go into a space, they're gonna do some construction, most notably drywall. The drywall would represent a leasehold improvement. We have a gross, we have a gross amount and then we have the accumulated depreciation and amortization. The depreciation applies to the buildings, the machinery, equipment, and the software. The amortization applies to the leasehold improvements. So then we get a net balance. This will tie into the balance sheet, but it gives the reader a little more insight as to where the growth in the fixed assets are. Okay. And then here, what this note contains is information about the future. Folks, this does not apply to things that have happened. It is applying to things that are going to happen. What this note basically says is that from the years 2018 to 2022, this is how much in purchases Apple is expecting to make with its suppliers as it relates to merchant, to materials, internet, etc. Okay, this is nothing more than giving the reader a heads up as to what is expected to happen in the future. But folks, one thing that I just want you to keep in mind, this term off balance sheet can really raise the hair on a reader because this is something that Enron did to hide a lot of debt to make its financial position look a lot healthier than what it really was. Beware of this. Off balance sheet simply means that debt is being removed off the books. Leases has been an example of off balance sheet, but the FASB through GAP has changed this. Just be aware of it. It's something that when you see off balance sheet, really go through the notes to see whether there is something that looks rather peculiar. Because I know I can tell you from my experience, off balance sheet can definitely raise causes for concern. But once again, this note, is focused on the future, not what has happened, but what is expected to happen. Then we have here, you can see that the sales are broken down by product. And of course, it has the most material product, the iPhone, the iPad, the Mac, services, other products. And we can take a look by year, what's going on. So as you can see, 
2016, once again, we have an almost $20 billion decline. Well, we can see a large part of that is in the iPhone. I'd like to know more why the iPhone sales dropped almost $20 billion. Definitely a question I think it's worth answering. And I, what I also find very interesting, notice the services. The services have steadily gone up. I'd like to know what kind of services Apple's providing so to see whether there could be any change in the business strategy. Now here in this particular slide, folks, what I'd like you to get as a takeaway from this slide is the issues that still remain when it comes to convergence, the movement of the United States to adopt international financial reporting standards. When we get into inventory in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna get into this point in greater detail, the last in, first out, or LIFO. Inventory write downs also come into play. Something to keep in mind, Fair value. Fair value, the synonym of fair value is market value. Gap will lean much more the historical cost because the dollar amount can be trusted. There is a source document, whether it be a contract or an invoice, that can support the amount being carried on the financial statements. I think one of the biggest issues that exists today, development cost. The conversion of ideas into prototypes or minimal viable products. As you can see, within GAP, development cost go to the income statement, but for IFRS, development cost go to the balance sheet. Expensed means income statement, Capitalized means balance sheet. As you can see, we're gonna get into this as we progress in our journey during the semester, but this is a very nice summary to keep in mind because folks, I will tell you a number of these issues are reasons why convergence has slowed down. And in my opinion, I don't see convergence happening anytime soon, especially when we're dealing with the issues like the historical cost versus fair value, expensing versus capitalization, okay? Folks, before I continue, does anyone have any questions on what I've talked about so far? Okay, the last learning objective for this chapter. This week, our focus is on return on assets. And return on assets represents a relationship between the net income being earned and the assets being employed. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, this word average. Always remember, when we're using a ratio, that is looking at a relationship between an element of the income statement to an element of the balance sheet. The income statement element communicates over a period of time. The balance sheet element communicates at a moment of time because we have to make sure that the element that communicates at a moment of time communicates over a period of time, we have to do an average. So when we do the average total assets in the return on assets calculation, we take the beginning total assets, add the ending total assets, and divide by two. The average is a way to communicate over a period of time. Does anyone have any questions about that before I continue? Okay, so what does this relationship mean? Well, let's suppose that the return on assets ratio 
generates a number of 0 0.50, okay? What the 0 0.50 simply means is the following. For every dollar that a company has employed in assets, the assets are earning income at a rate of 50 cents. That's very simply what the return on assets means. But here's the thing, folks, that we can do with return on assets. We can use the ratio that I talked about in chapter three, the profit margin ratio, and the ratio that I talked about in chapter four, the asset turn turnover ratio. We can take the results of the mar net profit margin ratio or margin, multiply that by the total asset turnover ratio or turnover to get the return on assets. And this becomes very handy when we want to do a dissection or an analysis. When we look at margin, we can look at margin by breaking it down further, looking at the margin as it relates to operating income to net sales or gross profit to net sales. The asset turnover, we can look at the average current assets. We can look at the average long-term assets. We can do a number of things that can help us understand how productive the assets are in earning income. And the way that I would encourage you to do it is to look at return on assets by focusing on margin and turnover. And I can tell you in the projects that I did in graduate school, we focused on return on equity. Return on equity had a third element called leverage. And leverage focused on the relationship between average total assets and average stockholders equity. And from that, you really can get a handle on the company's ability to earn income on behalf of the stockholders. This, by taking a look at margin and turnover and breaking it down further, by doing ratios, by taking the operating income to net sales, the gross profit to net sales, that's within the profit margin ratio, within the total asset turnover ratio, taking the net sales, comparing that to average current assets, net sales to average long-term assets, you can get a sense for where the strengths or the weaknesses are. And that's, folks, but really what analysis is. We're taking the pie and we're slicing the pie in a way to see how good the pie really is, okay? If anyone would like to engage in more conversation regarding this, please feel free to let me know. I'll be more than happy to do that. And if any of you or a number of you would like me to expand on this as part of a lecture, I'll be happy to do so. Now, the thing to keep in mind is all of this work that we've done in previous weeks, that can help us understand the effects on ratios. And you can see we have a process to determine how transactions affect these ratios. So let's begin by looking at this. Apple has incurred an additional $1,000 in research and development that it paid in cash. Well, what's the effect on the net profit margin ratio? Well, we know that research and development will have no effect on sales, but will have an effect on income. Because the R&D is an expense, it's going to reduce net income. So as you can see, this additional research and development lowers the net profit margin. And folks, there are people out there 
One of them, Baruch Lev, who I've talked a little bit about this semester, and I'm going to continue with it later in the semester, has been a passionate advocate of having R&D or research and development considered as an asset rather than an expense. So it doesn't be looked at as a penalty for companies. Because as you can see, R&D or research and development innovation here it appears that it is punishing the company by lowering its profit margin now when we look at this how would this r d expenditure affect the return on assets well we know that the expenditure affects income in the form of research and development and it affects assets when it comes to cash. But notice in the fact that when it comes to assets, we're doing an average. So what we have to do is we're not looking at the entire $1,000 for the cash disbursement, we're looking at an average. Because as you can see, the $1,000 expenditure affects the ending balance, not the beginning balance. So as a result, by averaging, the transaction effect under assets is only $500. Zero plus 1,000 divided by two gives us 500. Does anyone have any questions about that? So when we look at the effect after this transaction, return on assets go down, but only goes down by three one thousandths of a point. So this effect is pretty small. Well, now let's take a look at this. Apple has settled an obligation. It's paid down in accounts payable. Well, what effect is this going to have on the current ratio? Well, we know the current ratio expresses a relationship between current assets and current liabilities. Because cash has been paid, current assets will be affected. Because an accounts payable has been settled, current liabilities is going to be settled. So as you can see, current assets are going to decrease by $4,000. Current liabilities is going to decrease by $4,000. But the key thing here, folks, look what happens to the current ratio. Even though it's not by much, the current ratio improves. And this is one thing to keep in mind when you're seeing companies reducing its liabilities, a reason for doing so, it's right here. It, the company wants to improve its current ratio in a way that projects stronger liquidity. In other words, the company wants to communicate to its audience that it is more capable of paying its bills when it comes due, okay? Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Now here, as you can see, as it affects the ratios, we have guidance to determine what's what. And as you can see, the same change in the numerator and in the, dom in the, in the denominator. If we increase both the numerator and denominator, if the ratio is currently less than one, the ratio is going to increase. If it's greater than one, the ratio is going to decrease. It works the opposite way if both the numerator and the denominator decrease. If the existing ratio is less than one, and we're decreasing both the numerator and the denominator, the ratio is going to decrease. But if the ratio is currently greater than one, and we decrease both, like we just did with the payment of the $4,000 accounts payable, the current ratio is going to increase, okay? So this is a little bit of guidance. This is a nice piece of reference material 
to help you as it relates to how will these ratios be affected when both the numerator and the, and the denominator are changed in the same direction. In other words, both the numerator and the denominator increase or both the numerator and the denominator decrease, okay? Okay, folks, does anyone have any questions on what I talked about this evening? Okay, folks, what I wanna do now is I wanna go through a process of basically catching up from where we left off a couple of weeks ago. And again, I apologize for the cancellation of last week's class. If you have not yet seen the email that I have generated, I did do a recording this morning of material from chapter four, the lecture that I would have done last week. I was able to do the recording and I was able to send the file containing the recording. But folks, I will tell you the main reason I was able to send the recording was it was notably shorter than what I've done in the past. One of the things that I have found as an issue was when I record the lectures of classes, where the lectures are like this, we're talking two hours, two hours longer, I have a difficult time uploading the file and sending it. So what I end up doing is I upload the file to YouTube and I end up sending the YouTube link. And I'm gonna be doing this with Angus. I'll have to let him know. So folks, to keep in mind, I've been rather hesitant since I had a lot of trouble a few weeks ago with the process of uploading the recorded file but I found that if I do it through YouTube, I have an ability to do this process. So going forward, unless something happens, I'm gonna have a process to play that if you miss a class, I will record the class. But what I will do in time is I will upload the file to YouTube and I will send the link to the YouTube file. Now, in doing that, I have to create a channel. And I have a channel that contains the recordings of the lectures that I've done. So if any of you would like to get a link to my channel, feel free to let me know and I'll send you the link to the channel because it could be another way for you to gain a little bit of information regarding the lectures that I have done. But I will only do the recordings when a student or group of students are unable to attend the class. So I definitely wanted to catch up on that. Second thing that I wanted to get into is this week's assignment, quiz three. Folks, I was rather hesitant in the way I set up quiz three because I was looking at the material and I'm like, oh goodness, this is gonna, this is basically a repeat of what you're gonna be doing with the course project. But then I thought about it and I'm like, well, I'm assigning five quizzes during the semester. And the third quiz marks the midpoint. And then I was thinking, well, maybe people would like to get a little bit of practice working on the ratios. So in case you were wondering why I have this quiz, quiz three, focusing on material that you're gonna be working on when it comes to the project. Well, I did it because we're at the midway point when it comes to quizzes. And I wanted to give you a little bit of practice on the ratios to help inspire some confidence as you progress with the project. So this week's assignment, quiz three, I am really focusing on the material that we covered from chapters three and four, but the two main points are the profit margin ratio and the asset turnover ratio. Now, next week, the first exam will be active for the semester. 
And next week's exam is going to cover material from chapters one through five, okay? Now, what I did when I prepared the exam, because the quizzes covered material from chapters two, three, and four, I minimized the questions coming from those three chapters. The bulk of the questions that are going to appear on exam one are going to come from chapters one and five. What I want to do is I want to try to get some form of balance from the assignments that are being prepared. I figured since the quiz is covered three of the five chapters, I wanted to make sure I had some emphasis on the two chapters that I did not have for the quizzes. So chapters one and five will dominate the first exam. And like the quizzes, use your reference material when answering questions. That would be the slides that I use for presentation, and you'll find the slides in Sakai, the textbook, which you'll find in Connect, and you'll have access to the ebook when you're taking the exam, and any notes that you're taking. And keep in mind the exam, like the quizzes, will be in Connect. The timetable remains the same. It will become active on Sunday morning and will be active through the end of the day next Saturday. So at 12 a.m. Sunday, September, Sunday, October 17th, exam one will become active. And exam one will be active until the end of the day, 11.59 p.m. Saturday, October 23rd. So you have seven full days, like the three quizzes, to submit your answers. And folks, that's a reminder. You have until the end of the day this Saturday, Saturday, October 16th, to submit your answers to the third quiz. So this week, it's good, the next two weeks, this week and next week, a little bit hectic because we're going to have a quiz and an exam that's going to be due. And I purposely had the exam set in this manner because I see the chapter five ending as the end of a key point, which is basically what I call foundation building. Build the foundation to understand this field of study called financial accounting. Because next week, our journey is going to change and it's going to change noticeably. Next week, our focus is going to be on chapter six. And in that chapter, we're going to get, begin focusing on individual elements of the balance sheet. We're going to focus on cash and receivables next week. Chapter six, our focus is going to be on receivables and cash. And that journey is going to continue when we proceed to inventories, fixed assets, intangible assets, current liabilities, long-term liabilities, stockholders' equity. So things are going to be a bit different beginning next week, and I think you're going to find it rather interesting because we're really going to get into the slices of the pie, the pie being the financial statements, and the slices so that you'll have a better understanding of how we communicate receivables, inventories, and the like. So we're going to be making a noticeable shift in the material that we're gonna be covering for the remainder of the semester, okay? So again, just to conclude, I have recorded this lecture. I'm doing this again for Angus who's missing tonight, but just as a reminder with the recordings, if you're unable to attend a class, please let me know. I will record it. Hopefully if all goes well with technology, I'll be able to upload the video to YouTube and I'll provide a link to the YouTube video. That's basically the the simplest way that I found of doing this. Regarding assignments, quiz three is the assignment that's active this week. You have until the end of the day this Saturday to submit your answers. And then next week, 
The assignment that will be active will be the first exam of the semester. It will cover material from chapters one and five. What I'm going to be emphasizing, material from chapters one and five, okay? Does anyone have any questions on what I've talked about regarding this? Okay, folks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this 